Hi, X. Long time lurker, first time posting here. Anyone interested in Far East spooky stuff? Be me, German descent. Parents moved to Korea before I was born. Because of dad going on business trips all the time, plus general parental conflict, Korean friends' family pretty much raised me as their own. New family is crazy superstitious, which is weird since most of the country now believes in Christianity. Live in the mountains with Korean family for most of my childhood, then moved to the city around high school age. I honestly didn't even consider all of this to be creepy. It was just a part of life to me. Recently, I moved to the United States, and whenever I mention the stuff that happened in my childhood, my new friends lose their shit. I guess I'll post a few and see if you guys might be interested. Here's a little background. Korean foster family is from North Korea. They all came down during the Korean War. Superstitious grandfather, Christian grandmother, both maternal. Parents, friends with my parents, who always wanted to get the fuck out of the mountains. Daughter who's my age and was pretty much my only friend. Grandfather is the patriarch and what he says goes. This includes all sorts of weird traditional ceremonies and rituals. Generally, a pretty chill family. Lots of conflict about grandfather's superstitious bullshit though. And you can kind of see the mom kind of losing her mind over the years for some unknown reason. Live in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. You have to drive like 30 minutes to reach the nearest town. Sorry if this is all jumbled. This is my first time rationally looking back and writing it down. If there's anything I can do to make it better, do tell me. This is about a ritual we used to do a few times every year. Apparently, there are families in this city that also perform it, but none of my other Korean friends have gone through quite what I used to. On the death day of his ancestors, grandfather sets up a mini shrine and prepares a shitload of food. It only has to be specific kinds of dishes and it has to be arranged according to color and size. After setting up the food on special tables in the living room, Grandfather reads a handwritten letter, generally following the lines of, Everyone misses you, rest well, please take this offering of food in peace, and burns it. He sometimes adds a line about me, something like, Please excuse the blonde boy, we are taking care of him, as this ritual is usually only performed by the family. Everyone takes turn bowing in a special ceremony away. When everyone is done bowing, Grandfather turns off all lights, and everyone hides in the kitchen for about half an hour. You always have to clear your throat before walking out again, to not startle the ancestors, grandfather says. Food is partially eaten, utensils are dirty, and the seat cushions are warm. This one time when I was about six, the mom got tired of making the specific dishes. They're time consuming as fuck, since they take up the whole day, if not more, and replace them with easier ones. Grandfather flies into a rage, but we don't have time to redo everything. Do you realize what you've done? And all of that. Finish bowing and hide in the kitchen. Hear rattling and banging from the living room. The kids get shitless, so me and the daughter hold on to the grandfather while he swears under his breath. An hour later, the noise stops. Grandfather clears his throat, goes outside, turns on the light. The dishes are overturned. Candles are out. Something that looks like either dried blood or watery fecal matter, I can't remember, is strewn on the shrine. The mom always made the correct dishes from then on. Fucking nine-tailed foxes, man. These bastards are creepy as shit, but the media now portrays them as some kind of big titty cutie pie fairy's wet dream. B13. Sorry in advance about the stories not being in timed order. No porn or anything in the fucking mountains, but discovered how to jerk it. One day I go into the mountains with daughter, we'll call her Jin, to find some mushrooms. Bring one of the family jingle dogs just to be safe. Those fuckers are protective as hell. Having a good time and fucking around when Ogu the Jindu starts to bark like crazy. We see a teenage looking girl just kinda standing there. Wearing old fashioned clothes, but since this is a rural area, think nothing of it. Go say hi. Glad we found someone else around our age. 
New Girl says her family moved into the empty plot about 15 minutes away. Ogu is still barking at her, but we brush it off. He's just being protective. Hang out with her for a bit. She keeps touching me, commenting on my hair and eyes, saying I'm exotic and cute. Totally gonna get laid, that JPEG. The sun starts going down, so we ask her if she wants to come over and have dinner with us. No, but only a non can come over to my place and see my room if he wants. It's getting dark and brother instincts kick in, so I tell the new girl I'll drop by later and take Jin home. Fucking cock-blocked, pissed off as hell. Later tell grandfather what happened. Idiot boy, the empty plot isn't for sale. He tells us to take a jindu wherever we go from then on. We meet her a few times later that week. She progressively gets more and more seductive. Dogs bark at her, so just go home. We just ran home and told Grandfather what happened. A few days later, Ogu brings home a fox that he killed. Never see the girl again. Basically, nine-tailed foxes, gomiho, shapeshift into women whose corpses they eat. They seduce and kill men whose livers they eat. Once they eat a thousand livers, they turn into real humans or something. Forgot pig. See pig related. Grandfather said there are two types of ghosts. Yuryong, which are just docile spirits, and Guishin, which are malicious spirits that usually just want closure. There was a small lake near where we lived. Grandfather always told us to take a white jindu when we went near the lake, as there was a Guishin who lived there. Guishin who live in bodies of water are called Mu Guishin, but this one was a Chunya Guishin, a virgin who had been wronged. Occasionally, from far away, you can make out a youngish-looking woman who looks soaked as hell just sitting on the dock. Always thought she looked lonely and sad instead of angry. This one time, when I'm about nine, I got brave and walked out to the lake. Still pretty far away, but I can see the Guishin sitting on the dock again. Being the autist I am, I call out something like, Lady, are you okay? Guishin gets up starts walking towards me. When I say walking, it was more like a cross between walking and gliding. Kind of like when you stand still and look at someone going through one of those moving runways in an airport. Anyways, the Guishin keeps coming closer, and suddenly, I realize that I forgot to bring a white jindo. Oh shit. The Guishin is close as hell now, and I can see that her facial features are all kind of blacked out and melted all together, like ink mixing in water. I scream, she screams too, but stops when I stop making a noise, and sort of studies me. She makes a weird gurgling noise, like someone is trying to laugh underwater. Your head is yellow. She walks slash glides back to the dock. I run all the way back home, the piss cooling on my pants. The next day, grandfather makes me bring some food as an offering to the lake to thank the Guishin for not harming me. I like to think that I made her day. Here's some info on the Jindus. Korea's national dog. Kinda looks like a Shiba, but taller, leggier, and just more brutal. Comes in three colors. White, tan, and black slash tan. Hardy little fuckers, skinny as hell, but they can take out your legs like it's nothing. Protective as fuck about territory. Stubborn bastards these are. You can't train them like a Labrador Retriever to do cute tricks, or sit for the food, or not bite annoying children. But they'll give their lives to protect you and your home. In Korean superstition, white jindus chase away evil spirits, tan jindus can fight their way out of anything, and black jindus make spirits accept you as one of them. Grandfather rarely had black jindus. He was a fighter, so he had a bunch of tan jindus and some white ones for the kids and I'm pretty sure the shotgun he had in his closet was illegal. You can't own a gun in Korea. Pick related. Korean troll, anyone? B11. Our toughest tan Jindu died. More on this later. So grandfather got another one. He's a hard one, even when he's a puppy. Loyal as fuck to grandfather and Jin. By the time he's one years old, 
He's bigger and brawnier than the other dogs. His name is Suk Gu. One day, Jin wants to go down to the creek and catch some fish. Grandfather tells her to take a white Jindu, but she takes Suk Gu. Contemplate going with her, but I was helping grandmother out with some chores, so I stay behind. Besides, I get the feeling that her mom has started to hate me being around her too much. A few hours later, we hear something that sounds like a tiger from the mountains. I ask grandfather, as tigers are probably extinct in Korea. Might be Dukebai. Dukebai are pretty much Korean trolls. They don't really mean serious harm, but they are strong as fuck and enjoy messing with people. Sometimes, they'll unwittingly drive someone mad or kill them. The sun is going down, but Jin and Sugu aren't home yet. Grandfather starts getting worried. Sometime later, we see Jin running home, alone, screaming. She says a human hand, but with claws, came out of the bushes. She ran home, but the last she saw was Suku jumping into the bush to fight whatever was there. Her parents try to reason and say it was probably a lost person. Grandfather brushes this off. You two were raised in the city and know nothing. Why would a lost person be this far away from a town? Then, we see something run towards the house from far away. It's fucking Suku. He has a fucking leg in his mouth. It's like a human leg, except way bigger and covered in hair. It's gnawed through the thigh, but there's no blood. Just a weird watery stuff splattered all over it and Sugu. Grandfather confirms it's a Dukabai and throws out the leg deep into the mountains. We put out food for about a week as an apology to its clan. They leave human-like shits in our yard as a sort of fuck you for about a month. The thing about growing up in rural Korea as a foreigner is that if you run into a spirit, they're either going to be extra hostile towards you or they're going to be too busy laughing at you to kill you. The closest school was half an hour away, so grandfather would drive me and Jin to school every morning. There were only seven kids in our grade. Only three graduated. The rest either died or moved to the city. The kids were pretty cruel and ganged up on me a lot, calling me names like Yellow Monkey or Yankee. I'm German. Grandfather thought school was shit, so he let me skip school as long as I showed up for exams and passed them. When I was 10, he got me my very own white jindu, which I named Begu. Exploring the mountains and picking slash eating mushrooms one day, hear something rustle in the bushes, and Begu starts whimpering and cowering. A black dog-like creature slinks out from the bushes, freezing my tracks. I wasn't sure if he was friendly or malicious, but Begu was clearly scared and pissing himself. It looks like a cross between a big dog and a leopard but it has a long, almost trunk-like snout. The fur looks like it's ablaze and smoldering, although there is no fire or heat. The thing makes a snarling slash growling motion, but no sound comes out of its mouth. Convinced that this is how I die. I hear a gunshot go off in the distance and remember that my grandfather has his illegal gun. Another gunshot goes off, this time so close to my ears, my whole skull feels like it's ringing, and I could see the bullet was by. The fucking thing chases after the bullet, and is gone. I hightail out of there with my dog and grandfather. What I ran into turned out to be a Bulgasari. They eat fire and metal, and are highly hostile apparently. As this one had claimed the deep mountains as its home, we were forbidden to go that deep from then on. One thing about Korean ghosts, both docile and malicious, is that they are very much like people. You can reason with them most of the time. You can trick them, scare them, and even make friends. Of course, if you just want them to fuck off, the best thing you can do is start singing. Although, grandfather said this could potentially attract Duke Bai. B14. Go to school one day because fuck it. When school ends, leave book bag in classroom and go out with Jin to throw out the trash. No janitors at school, so kids help out with the work. Go to pick up bag while Jin waits outside. Teacher is standing with her back to the door, just kind of staring at something on the wall. 
say goodbye. She doesn't respond. Gets slightly nervous, so I ask her if she's okay. She turns around, and oh shit, she doesn't have a face. Dog Yaw Guishin are malicious spirits that act just like people, but have no face, hence the name, Dag Yaw Eagles Egg. From what I know, they'll usually leave you alone, as long as you don't point out their lack of face, or act disgusted. The thing acts just like the teacher, and it's just heading way too close to the uncanny valley now. Creeped out, but also kind of pissed off because I'm a moody teenager, and I just want to go home. It starts talking, and even its voice sounds like my teacher. Anon, do you think I'm pretty? Bitch, you don't even have a face. I don't want to piss these things off because Korean ghosts get vicious as fuck when they're mad. If I say, you're pretty, it will say I'm lying because it clearly doesn't have a face. If I say, you're not pretty, it will say I'm disgusted at its lack of face. I just want to go home and play with my goddamn dog and also go fishing. Start singing the Korean national anthem really loudly. Things start screaming, sounding equally angry. I hear the classroom door open and the screaming stops abruptly. Anon, what are you doing? It's the actual teacher. Run home and bitch about Gui Shins with Jin. Things started falling apart by my mid-teen years. I believe this was because my grandfather was getting old and weak. But it just may be because I was pretty messed up emotionally. And whatever spirits out there could sense it. B-16, doing some chores around the yard when I hear familiar voices. It's my mom and dad. I walk towards their voices, kind of tearing up because I haven't seen them since I was like four. And the only reason I remember them are the phone calls that come once every few months. Angry but glad at the same time. My parents are standing at the edge of grandfather's property. Anon, it's us. Let's go home now. So many things I want to yell at them, but it's like I'm too choked up. Remember grandfather didn't tell me my parents would be coming for me. I'm going to bring grandfather. Oh, but Anon, aren't you going to let your mother hug her own son? Notice something's wrong about it, but I'm too emotionally shaken. Start crying like a little bitch and kind of stand there. The dogs are barking like crazy. I can hear Jin calling me for dinner from the house. My parents keep urging me to come over and give them a hug. To go home. To talk to them. Come on, son. It's going to be a long drive home. Wait a second. Then where's your car? They go quiet, but soon try to play it off as a joke. I keep asking where the car is. They get angry and start threatening me with punishments, saying that I'm breaking my mom's heart, etc. I'm still sobbing and hyperventilating, not sure whether to go with them or run back home. I think Jin noticed and told Grandfather, because he came out with a dog on a leash. The dog starts growling and this old leathery Korean fart bellows like a goddamn ox. Leave my grandson alone, you fucking creatures! My parents let out something like a cross between a bird screeching and an old door creaking, then disappear into the grass. For some reason, Grandfather never speaks of this again. This shit still chokes me up a little. I have a few more stories that aren't too mundane. Oh look, there's a ghost, or now he's gone. So I'll be posting them for the next few hours. Here's how our toughest dog died. Relatives come to visit for the weekend. Jin's cousins come too. One is a guy about five years older. The other is a guy two years older than us. There's also a girl, but she just sits in the kitchen and does Bible study with grandmother all day, so we just ignore her. We try to get along at first, but the cousins are too boisterous, yelling cuss words in the mountains, throwing rocks at deer, etc. Eventually, we just let them do their own thing. It turns out while Jin, grandfather, and I went fishing, these fuckers went into the mountains and found a small family graveyard. Korean family graveyards are tiny, with four or five bodies buried at most, especially if you find one in the rural areas. Anyways, these fuckers trashed the place, kicking down shrines and littering everywhere. They came home after they heard someone crying and got scared. 
Grandfather is seething, but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't expect city kids to understand. For the next few days, we see angry ghosts at the edge of our property, hissing at our dogs, but not able to come any closer because of our white jindus. We leave offerings around the property, but they are pissed as hell, and they won't stop trashing our vegetable gardens. Grandfather generally looks stumped. One day, our most prized tan jindu disappears. We think he may be hunting something, but he doesn't come home for days. Eventually, we go out to look for him. Find his body, ripped to shreds, strewn around the trashed graveyard. His intact head is in front of the damaged shrine. Grandfather quietly covers his dog's head with a towel. Doesn't talk to us for a few days. Just smokes his pipe out on the patio and stares into the mountains. I still miss the dog. I always think he sacrificed himself as an offering to save everyone else. In Korean mythology, magpies are harbingers of good luck and prosperity. It's said if you hear a magpie calling in the morning, it means you'll have a friendly visitor later in the day. I like to think that magpies acted like a sort of guardian angel to me. My room is in the second floor, right next to the persimmon tree in the garden. Magpies fucking love persimmons, and there are always a bunch of them near the house. Grandfather and I make a habit of leaving the persimmons at the very top when picking them from the tree, so that way, the magpies can help themselves. This is just at the level of my window, so I guess the magpies kind of associated seeing my face with food and general good vibes. Come home from school one day. For some reason, I'm really tired as fuck, so I take a nap. Magpies won't stop fucking calling, though. Some even bang and peck the window. Like an autist, I yell, Shut up, birds! and try to sleep. They're too fucking loud. Swearing, I get up and storm out of the room to sleep somewhere else. As I turn to close the door, I catch a glimpse of something stuck to the ceiling. It's a motherfucking ghost. As I stare, its head turns towards me, and it gives me the ugliest fucking look. But before it can react to me leaving the room, the magpees start calling and banging out the window, and it turns its attention to the birds. Run out and alert grandfather. Guy grabs a pot and pan, runs up to my room, flings open the door, and starts banging the pot and pan while yelling, Get the fuck out! Ghost hisses and slithers into the cracks of the wall. We knew someone died in that house before we moved in. We just didn't know the guy had hanged himself in my fucking room. We leave out an offering that night and I sleep on the couch. The next morning, the offering is gone and we don't see that ghost again for a good three months. Whenever the ghost appears again, the magpies do their squawk and I fetch grandfather. Feels pretty good having a personal army of magpies. Last story, B-17. Start kinda having a thing for Jin, but we don't show it because A, it's a bit like incest, and B, her mother is completely off the hook at this point and would kill us both. One day, grandfather goes to tend to his berry patches and doesn't return. We look for him for a few hours and find him on the ground, looking peaceful and composed as hell. Like he just laid down to take a nap and never got up. Doctors tell us he died of a heart attack. I'm stunned. The man who took me in after my own family put me aside taught me all the values I ever held dear, basically kept me alive these years in a patch of mountain crawling with unknown creatures, was gone just like that. Jin is also inconsolable, and we spend a lot of time setting out by grandfather's favorite fishing spot, not saying anything. We bury him in a private plot. Jin and I go to his grave every day to clean his shrine. A few months later, grandmother sells our house and we move to the city. All the dogs are sold too, including mine. I'm too shocked to pretend nothing happened and to live with my adopted family and I'm too angry to live with my biological family. Grandmother gives me enough money to rent out a small apartment, barely larger than a closet. Couldn't focus on anything, so I fail my college entrance exams. Barely scrape by, flipping burgers and working at gas stations, convenience stores, and stocking warehouses. In a way, it's more peace than I've ever known, as I see no ghosts in my apartment. 
Sometimes I wonder about what happened to Jin as we grew apart, and I knew her mother was off her rocker, and sometimes physically hurt her. Meanwhile, Jin is accepted to a good college. We decide to go to Grandfather's grave and show him the acceptance letter, as well as perform the ritual. And we just don't talk to each other ever again. It was getting too weird. The whole family follows us, for some reason. It's getting dark. Just before we leave, Jin places her acceptance letter on Grandfather's shrine. Suddenly, her mother starts screaming, He's dead, you crazy kids! He can't fucking hear or see any of this shit! She accuses Grandfather of being crazy, and then yells at Jin for being stupid enough to believe all that bullshit. We try to argue back, but you saw it too! But she's raving at this point. Eventually, she calms down enough for Jin's dad to take her back to the car. We just sit in front of Grandfather's grave for the longest time. When we finally head back, I swear I can see a bluish flame-looking thing flickering above the grave. Weeks pass, getting paid just enough to get by and trying to forget everything that ever happened in my childhood. One night, I hear incessant tapping on my window. Almost like how the magpies used to tap. Wait, I live in the basement. There is no window. Feel a deep, shuddering, cold feeling in my guts. I always thought it was alerting me to a spirit nearby, but now I realize it's fear. I run wildly into the street and catch a taxi to grandmother's house. I can hear screaming inside. The door bursts open and Jin runs out, blood on her arms and her face as white as paper. Something in her mother's head had snapped, and she had grabbed a kitchen knife and slashed at Jin. What about your dad and grandmother? Dad's visiting his family and grandmother was too afraid to come out of her own room. Jin swears up and down that just as her mother was about to seriously stab her, a blue flame flickered out of nowhere and lit her skirt on fire. I try my best to calm her down and call 911. Things settle down from there. Jin and I realize nobody else will understand us as well as each other. We're getting married next winter. Her mother is diagnosed with schizophrenia. Grandmother goes to live with Jin's aunt. Thanks, Grandpapa. Thanks for hanging on with me for the ride, X.